Welcome to the Ripcord Moment. I'm your host, Joe C2. Today, we're joined by Melissa Blue and Melissa Mihal, uh, and they are the co-founders and best friends that started Melly's Monster Cookies. Uh, they're a gluten-free company with a cookie mix that is now in over 9,000 stores, including Walmart and Target. And it was a family recipe, I understand, uh, Melissa Blue from your side of the family, uh, that you decided to go ahead and create a business model around this because I believe it's one of your, your children or somebody in your family had gluten allergies. And so you've now taken this uh, idea and trans, you know, transformed it into a, a powerhouse of a company. So I'm excited to have both of you here uh, with us today. Well, we're excited to be here. Thank you for having us. Well, so maybe let's start with the, the dynamic, which is you guys have been very close friends for uh, something like 30 years. And so, you know, many entrepreneurs go into business, maybe with family or, or friends, and it not, doesn't always necessarily work out well, but it seems like you guys have been able to navigate uh, that, that particular uh, dynamic of the relationship. And so what sort of tips would you, would you put out there to others who are considering going down this path that the two of you have gone down? Well, um, I'll take this one. I think we have, um, you know, some different things that have made it us have a successful business with our longstanding friendship. And I think some of the key things that have been important is that we have similar work ethics. Um, and I think, you know, we're, since we've been best friends since we were eight years old, we've been able to watch each other's work ethics um, in school or whether we were cheering on a team or anything like that, that we both had just inner motivation. Cause I think as a friendship, it would be hard if one wasn't working or one wasn't the other. But so starting off with that, that we have similar work, you know, hard work ethics. And then I think something that's benefited Melissa and I is that we have different skill sets. Um, she is more math minded and I'm more like language based. And so it's nice for us um, at times to be able to say, okay, you take this or, you know, I'll read all the contracts or all of that. And so we don't really get in each other's business. And it's nice to have someone say, I totally trust what, how you're going to handle that. Sure. Um, and so that I think has really been a good thing for us. And then I think also from the very beginning, we had the same vision. Um, I don't know where we came up with it, but we were wanted to be in every grocery store in the nation. And so um, we've almost accomplished our goal. So, Melissa, what, what would you add to, to that? Um, I think she covered a lot of it. I think having an inherent trust in your partner, knowing that, you know, you can always trust what they're doing and they're always trusting what you're doing and also being able to give and take. Like sometimes if Melissa has a strong opinion about something, I will give away and vice versa. So just really putting the relationship above the business, I think is important. And we always said that from the beginning, if, if we had to walk away from Melly's to save a friendship, we would. Well, I mean, do you guys have a rule of thumb where, um, you know, how do you handle if there is? I got to imagine there are times where there's a bit of conflict or tension or whatever it is. I mean, what, what's your secret sauce on resolving those those issues so you can stick true to that that promise that you made early on in the relationship, in the business relationship? I think some or when I look back on that, a lot of times we look to outside mentors to help us kind of guide us and inform us on different things. I know recently we were working on a decision and. Um, both of us were kind of not know, I mean, neither of us was hard on it. We just knew we didn't know exactly what we wanted to do. So we looked outside of ourselves to get more information to help us make better, clearer decisions. Don't you think, Melissa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good, you know, and if we, if we have to compromise, let's do that versus that. And next time we'll try it a different way. So I think we've just come up with creative solutions if we have disagreements, which is honestly shockingly been pretty rare. Mm -hmm. So we tend to have the same background and thoughts and oftentimes really are on the same page, which has been fantastic. Yeah, definitely. We're, and then as she said earlier, like I can tell when she cares more or she, she can tell if I care more about something and I'll just say, you care. That's fine. If the, I try, you know, I love you and I care more about you being that you really care about this and we'll just do it. So it, it really has very pleasantly worked out. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about the emotional or the, the friendship relational issue, but let's talk about the logistics issue. Uh, one of you's in Austin, one of you's in Fort Worth. Texas is a big state. Uh, how has navigated navigating just the issues of uh, not being in the same place physically with a you know with a newer company, a startup? How has how have you guys managed that? You know, I think it was nice. We started this company and for the first five years, both of us had young children and we grew it slowly, purposely. One, we were learning the business. 
Mm -hmm. We didn't have a location. We were in different cities, but it really played to our advantage in the beginning because Melissa lived in the Dallas Fort Worth area. So she Mm -hmm. could work those networks. And I lived in Austin, which is a huge consumer product, good, you know, town. And so I could meet people here and work the grocery circuit here. So we kind of got to work two really large areas in Texas without having to travel a lot. And then, you know, really, we like to say we were virtual before it was cool. So the pandemic has provided even further um, capabilities. We do a lot more Zooming with each other. We used to not do that. And we used to travel a lot. So we would see each other at least once or twice a month. So I don't know, it just kind of worked. You kind of, you just made it work. And with technology these days, it right. really hasn't been the barrier that might have otherwise right. uh, would have been in, in maybe prior generations. Right. Uh, Melissa Michal, anything you want to add to that from your perspective? No, I mean, it's just laughable because so many people told us prior to the pandemic that we wouldn't ever be taken seriously as a real company if we didn't have a headquarters. And yeah. we were just like, we don't believe that. And then because we have co-manufacturers, we're not manufacturing it. So and so much of our business is visiting those places and watching those relationships and doing, um, you know, the buyers. So we kind of had to be real proud of ourselves when we weren't carrying an overhead during the pandemic. So yeah. of a business that we didn't need. So that, that must have felt really good. <laughs> yeah, we were like, well, that's great. <laughs> so maybe we can pivot to the business struggles and let's talk a little bit about the pandemic. I mean, you pointed out that from the, the one hand, because you didn't have a large overhead, that you know certainly made you more nimble. You didn't have the same cash burn that other companies would have at mm-hmm. a startup stage. Um, but beyond that, what are what are some of the other effects that you had to navigate because of the pandemic? I think you know there were positives and negatives, as there were you know for most businesses during it. The positive was that we had just set all those. Um, cookie mixes in Walmart, Target, and Kroger in the fall of 2019. So then when everything was shut down and everyone was at home baking, Melly's was there on those shelves nationally. When Betty Crocker and Pillsbury were out of stock, Melly's was there. So we got a lot of trial and then we got to bring a lot of happiness and goodness to people, give them something to do baking wise. So um, that, that was good for us in the pandemic. But I think, you know, things that have been harder is that, um, in-person meetings went away with buyers and um, that is harder for us to, we always are going to sell the cookies better if we can go to headquarters, sit with them, have them taste the cookies. And it just doesn't translate over the zoom at all. And sadly, Melissa and I are saying, you know, we've just been watching now that we're a year or so out. Those buyers have gotten very comfortable doing the zooming and it's easier on them. And so um, a lot of them are not going back. So that has not been, you know, a plus for us um, after the pandemic and that hasn't really righted itself um, yet. Melissa, what am I missing there? I think uh, otherwise <clears throat> we were fortunate that most, you know, our products are all USA made. All of our packaging came from the US. So we didn't really have any struggles getting product made in the pandemic, which I know other people trying to get products and things overseas, that was difficult. So we were really lucky that that was our situation. And as Melissa said, the, the sales were great. We didn't have a lot of online presence and that maybe we missed a little bit of that. But um, other than that, yeah, people were at home baking. And so it was great. So it sounds like I'm hearing you, I'm hearing you that the fact you didn't have offshore supply chain issues to deal right. with, the fact you didn't have space rent overhead when the offices shut down both of those factors played materially to your advantage right especially at this stage of of the company's scale sure. for uh, sure with regard to sort of just the learning curve in general um what's that been like and, and not never having started a business it was it's it has been and continues to be a, a long learning curve i think <laughs> Um, Melissa and I obviously had no background in this, in a food space. I like to tell my friends that I never thought I would know so much about grocery stores, but I do. And I think it played to our advantage in the beginning because we didn't do things the traditional ways. We didn't necessarily hire a brokerage team and do all the things. We would take samples directly to stores headquarters and just drop them off and try to get a meeting. So we were really scrappy. So, um, that only worked so long and we got plenty of distribution with that, but we definitely have learned the business. Like distribution was a huge piece that we didn't understand at the beginning, how to get that, you know, done well. And, um, 
we've learned a lot from our co-packers. They, they have taught us the business and what to do, what not to do. There's so many ins and outs between sales and promotional items and distribution and supply chain, managing a team. You know, I mean, it, it, the, the list could go on and all the things we've learned and we've made mistakes along the way, of course, and we've ha had some wonderful mentors that have helped us along the way. So I would say it's just been a continual learning curve that we're you know, still on the trajectory to learn more as we grow. We just did a SKU um, is a Austin based incubator. And okay. in 2020, when everything was kind of shut down in the fall, we thought, well, we have time. And so we did that. And we, we came out of that with a lot of really great new initiatives for Melly's with some strategic changes and some packaging updates. And, you know, we did our first fundraise after that. So we really learned a lot through that SKU program. So, it, I mean, it seems like one of the, when I think about, I guess, sort of the, the, the value of the company from a business perspective is the brand. Yes, right? correct. You're, not, you're, you're using... Uh, a lot of the other, I mean, you don't, you're not doing your in-house, you're using co-packing, it sounds like. <clears throat> yes. For our audience, for example, like what, what is that to, uh, you know, uh, to some of us who aren't in the food business? That's well, it's very common in food. Um, it's just, it's you, you, it's like really co-manufacturing is probably the right, the more right term to make sense. Um, so they manufacture the goods under our recipe. Um, and under our direction, it works like from a purchase order, you know, we send purchase orders, they have our um, mix ingredients and all that stuff, and then they make it for us. And then, um, you know, it gets distributed from there. But in food, that is, there, that's just owning your own facility and from the, you know, federal guidelines standpoint and employees and all of that, it's just a whole nother business. And so we, from the very beginning, made the strategic decision that we were never gonna own our own facility. Um, so, it, so in, in, in essence, in some way, you look at our business and it's about a recipe and about branding and awareness and distribution. So let's maybe fast forward to the partnership. I believe it's HEB, if I remember correctly, that in many ways, I think sort of catapulted you to the next level. If I, and that was like around 2017. What did, you know, how did that come about? What, is that, what did that look like? How did that change your entire business model? Well, it was just a really fortunate experience. Um, the Our nine ounce frozen cookies were in HEB and the dry mix buyer loved our cookies. And so he came to us and said, my wife and I are obsessed with these cookies and I'm looking for some new brands and innovative stuff in that cookie mix space. Would you make a cookie mix out of your recipe? And so we had not even, we're not looking to expand, we're thinking about that. So, you know, essentially they just gave us this fantastic idea and then we worked with them to use their um, own co-packer, which just was just aligned in so many good ways because so a large part of if you are co-manufacturing is finding a really good co-manufacturer who has all the different um, certifications that you need and also has the scale and capacity if you grow quickly, which we did in this business. And so it was awesome. We went into stores exclusively in 2018 and then then we were able to launch ni nationwide with those cookie mixes in 2019. And now that's 90% of our business. So it really was a game changer for us. Melissa, from your perspective, from your perspective, what um, were there any, I guess, uh, drawbacks or, you know, what's the right word? Um, I guess hesitation from either of you in when this relationship started to, uh, I guess, transpire, was it almost like, uh, is this too good to be true? Um, and I don't know, even a little bit of imposter syndrome, or were you guys like over the moon, like we're absolutely doing this? Like, what was that like? Yeah, absolutely. There was no hesitation. It was not a guarantee. The, the, the buyer was like, I will help you, I will guide you, but I still may say no at the end of the at the end of the review time. So it was but like, was a there, it sounds like Oh, totally. Yes. So we okay. went down this whole, I mean, it was a lot of work and a lot of time because you have to design a box and just, and get the recipe and the price. I mean, it's just a big process to figure everything out. Mm -hmm. Thankfully he did say yes. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a great part of our business and it's just given us the capability. I think that set in the grocery stores is sleepy and 90% of it is, you know, Big brand brands. Brand the 1920s. It's just they're kind of older. And so I think we've really disrupted that set with a new, innovative, better for you cookie that also tastes amazing. So I think it was great. 
In terms of like, you know, <clears throat> names that the audience would know and, you know, sort of everyday people like myself. So Target and Walmart, right, mm -hmm. jump out. Uh, what's it been like working with, you know, two Fortune 500 companies, maybe Bohemoth, companies that have, you know, global presence? Honestly, it's been wonderful. We, the buyers on you know, Target, at Kroger, at Walmart, they're really have been wonderful people, great to work with, very good communicators, and it's helped. We are women owned. So that's been a nice thing. That's something that all of those companies really try to buy into and support. Okay. So, you know, I think they're, I know there's a lot of rumor mill about all kinds of people, you know, with the bigger companies, but we've really had fantastic experiences with our buyers at, at both of those spots. Well, when you say it's helpful that you're women owned, I mean, maybe you can unpack that a little bit more, dive deeper. I mean, obviously that's a, you know, uh, an important and critical initiative a lot of times with, with companies, but, you know, specifically what else is there? Well, we're certified women owned. So you, and we are certified with like the largest, most recognized body, um, or, you know, certifying body out there of minority owned companies. And these big companies have certain initiatives that um, some allow us to get paid quicker Okay. which is great. Um, others, like when we first went into Walmart, we went in under a program that she said, I'm only taking women owned and USA made. And we fit both of those. So often they are following some sort of initiative um, of that what they, you know, that their key core holdings to their company that they want to make sure that they recognize and Melly's um, being certified does fit into that a, a lot of times. This might tell you I didn't realize there was a certification or body for certification related mm -hmm. to this. You know, maybe talk to us a little bit about what that process is like, how one goes about doing that, because I think you're hitting on something that's incredibly valuable. Um, well, you just had to apply and then they do an interview process and they get all, I mean, my goodness, how many documents? We gave them like 40 documents. It was a ton. I mean, they very definitely high due diligence. And um, then, then we did, they would have typically done an on-site visit to make sure that we were actually legitimate. But since we were in the, this was a couple of years ago, we Zoomed it. But um, it was not an easy process um, just because there were so many documents required. And then it's, it renews from year to year, which is pretty quick. Um, we've, been, we've been certified by other bodies that have like a six year term on it. But this one, um, and it's um, WeBank. And it's the, you know, the largest owned, like women owned symbol that y'all would all recognize through um, goods. So is it, it's not specifically related to food, but it is consumer goods? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Got it. it may be all businesses. I don't really know. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely, if you're minority owned or, you know, women owned or anything under that umbrella, I would definitely mm -hmm. highly suggest you recognize that to, you know, whatever industry you're in, because I think people are just trying to diversify and make sure everybody's included, you yeah. know, as far as it doesn't mean you're going to get in because of it, but it's just a piece of the puzzle that might be helpful. No, great, uh, great information both of you are sharing. And I'm assuming with regard to the documentation, it's things like corporate documents, tax returns, just the, the typical, yeah. typical uh, stuff, stuff that totally. need to do due diligence on. Um, anything else related to, again, being a, you know, women owned, more of a startup, even though you've been around, I think, 10 years plus, compared to like these big firms like that you learned along the way with the Targets and the Walmarts that would be helpful for others to know about if they're going to be working with, partnering with big companies like that. I think we have learned that it's helpful to, we have a broker for both of those. And so having a broker that knows the ins and outs of their systems, every store, every group, every company has its own internal system that you have to learn. And so it is worth having a broker basically helps through sales calls, but they have weekly reporting. They help help you, you know, um, I don't know. Do I need to define what a broker is? Well, I guess it was it someone who facilitated the introduction, like to, to allow you to be able to get your product into those stores. They can do that. But we have typically found a broker post getting into the store. Melissa and I have been to these. There's these giant food shows. OK. And, you know, every industry has a convention, you know, this is the same kind of thing. And so we've actually gotten a lot of business from going to the food shows. We meet the buyer, we meet a buyer of a different category that introduces us to the correct buyer. So often we have found our bro brokers post getting into the stores, but it's just helpful with all the paperwork, 
all the ins and outs, like I said, of like Walmart's huge and they have their own huge system that, you know, to learn it all for us and to do that for every, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's super non-efficient. So they have several clients and, you know, they do it for lots of different different brands. And um, I think it's unique, you know, that we are a smaller brand and we're not Betty Crocker or Pillsbury. And I do think you know, with these food shows, when these target buyers or Walmart buyers find us, they kind of feel like they found something, you know, authentic, I guess, or yeah. cool, yeah. you know, and so that's why we've been able to get business without brokers. Um, just because I think we're a little bit like in a niche that they, you know, and we taste great. So um, I think that may be unusual. People might think that the brokers go out and get the business, but vast majority of the time we we bring the business to them. So but they're very helpful. I'm highly encouraged. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's, you know, let's let's maybe look forward to twenty, you know, twenty twenty three, twenty twenty four. Mm-hmm. What are some of the goals that you have on a go forward? Some of the growing pains you're working through right now. So we twenty twenty two was um, real for us. Um, the margins and the inflation, the cost of goods. Um, was difficult, um, but we um, have made it through and we've made a lot of changes for 2023. So we're really excited about that, that we have um, made some strategic decisions um, just based on, we kind of were waiting things out, hoping things would right the ship quicker, but it still didn't and hasn't. And so we've had to make some strategic um, changes internally um, going forward. And so now those are starting to hit and we're really excited and about the future um, of what we have had. Yeah, I think in 2022, we attempted to really hit the D2C space and do more online sales, but being a food company and already having a nationwide presence, we just thought we're not gonna spend any more time or resources on that. We're gonna hone in on where we are. We are in the retail stores. People are shopping all the time at the grocery stores. Yeah, That's where we're gonna do our business and that's where we're gonna grow. And we, you know, we're excited about 2023 for a few reasons. One, we have launched a new product, the mini cookie. It's a snacking item. And so our our goal is to grow that part of the business. The mixes are fantastic. It's a slower category. It's probably people buy one to two a month versus a snack they buy three or four times a month. So we're really trying to really bump up the revenues by introducing this um, new mini cookie in the snacking category. So we're excited about that. Oh, that sounds great. I can't wait to uh, follow your success. Well, I, you know, I call this the ripcord moment because I believe when when owners think about sort of their succession event, whether it's just business success in general or ultimately some sort of transaction, a sale to a third party or a family, you know, uh, transferring to a family member, um, they have to be prepared for that transaction and that sort of event. So I always ask our guests to give two sort of call to action items that they almost wish they knew earlier in their stage to ramp up their success quicker. And so if you were talking to Melissa and Melissa a few years ago, um, what would be those two action items you would impart to, you know, your former selves or to younger women entrepreneurs that are contemplating some sort of business? Well, one, I would say if you went back and told us, we probably would have raised funds earlier. Mm-hmm. We waited a long time and I would mm-hmm. have raised funds to build a team. Okay. And I would have built a team or I would I would tell someone to build a team with people who are familiar with the space, who have done it before and are experts in the field that you're in. So if you're in this consumer product industry with food, go find a marketing person who's done it before and knows what they're doing. You know, so I would say build a team of experts. Industry specific. Yes. Industry right. Specific because experts. we have made the mistake of hiring people thinking they have been in this industry, but not the exact right niche, but we can learn or they can learn. We can teach them. We just don't have time for that. Like the, this industry goes really quickly and there's just not time to, for someone to learn it. It's for us to grow as quickly as we wanted. We need people who already done it before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And maybe one other. Uh, I, yeah, I feel like I, I kind of went off our panel, but I think the second one would be to build a plan and try to stick to the plan, but also really use your network around you. I think finding mentors, building a, you know, even advisory board of people um, yeah. that might be helpful. So I think having, building that support network around you, um, again, with people who know that industry. So especially since if you don't have the experience, which yeah. a lot of people when they start a business don't. So I think finding that group and taking their advice, maybe going with your gut instinct sometimes, but also you know, taking their advice and heeding it as you plan for the future. 
So those are two great action items for, for owners to consider, right? Finding industry experts, perhaps raising money a little sooner before they need it, right? It's always good to have a few extra dollars in the bank to uh, <laughs> help with those growth strategies and unforeseen inflation yes, expenses. Absolutely, uh, yes. Well, Melissa and Melissa, thank you both so much for sharing your story, just being candid around, you know, what's worked, some of the struggles you've had. Really enjoyed our conversation. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. This is Joe C2 from the Ripcord Moment, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>